Welcome to THA Talks, for free thought and open minds. Hello, I'm Paul Obertelli and you're listening to edition 69 of THA Talks, the alternative podcast show from the UK, bringing you weekly shows and all the best interviews we can get our sticky mitts on. If you'd like to check out our full archive, just go to www.thatalks.com to listen to or to download all our free content. Our talks include news, conspiracies, spirituality, the occult, science, history, art, philosophy, religion and much more. For anyone who'd like to contact us and give us some feedback or recommend a guest for the show, you can email us at info at thatalks.com. That's info at thatalks.com. And don't forget you can subscribe to our show via our RSS feed and you can also find us on iTunes and Stitcher and many other podcast directories out there. Well, welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. It's good to be back as always. Big thank you to all those who have been sending us messages and leaving comments, supporting the show and letting us know what you like about it and whatnot. Um, also, we'd like to thank all those that have been linking the show and telling their friends about it. It does help us and uh, it's much appreciated. Um, if you have got a spare penny or two, you can go and donate. Go to our website and click on and uh, click on the donates, Donate tab. And uh, that will help us a lot as well. I am I am going to do a bit of a call out and um, read some of your messages out and give a few thank yous and so on. But um, I'm going to wait till I've got a good time to to do that so I don't miss anybody out. Um, so that is going to be on the agenda. But for now, we're going to crack on and we're going to go to the other side of London for a surge and a dramaturge and a man called David Parry. Nor shall my sword sleep in my hands. Till we have built Jerusalem in England's green and pleasant land. Good evening, Mr. Obertelli, how are you? And what a fantastic song that was. In fact, the guy who wrote the music for that song must be a talented chap, wouldn't you say? I think even distant family members are incredibly talented, actually, yes. He's a type of guy that's probably got a second name called Parry, I reckon. Oh, it seems to ring a bell. Yes, mm. I, I I remember all that from somewhere. Hubert, Sir Hubert, Hubert Parry. Hubert, of Sir Hubert Parry. Mm. Yeah. Let's leave that to our guests to work <laughs> out. But that, that is absolutely a fantastic song. If you just listen to the melody of that and just, oh, it's awesome. I really like it anyway. Um, so how are you, David Parry? Well, I left an inflammatory statement on Facebook earlier today because I'm sick of people getting the wrong impression about how my right-wing tendencies are, are, are simply hanging around me, which they're not. So, um, yeah, I feel like fighting. Today's fighting. Well, the problem is, the problem is, I think, I, I keep saying that there's no right-wing or left-wing anymore. There's just bad elements of both that are still lingering around and uh, the government is kind of absorbing a lot of those, I feel. Um, but it's kind of so you're getting anyone that's got an, an element of right-wing and they are a right-winger, but then they'll do something that's very left-wing as well and you're kind of, well, hang on, we, you, you're, you're there, and you can't kind of work out who's who. And I think it's, uh, I think there needs to be a, a new bird, I think, Chuck the post wings away and <laughs> get a new bird. What does I say, Paul? I mean, you and I, you know, we both agreed that there's right and wrong in both sides if there are these sides anymore. No, it got up my nose recently because actually I'm a libertarian and I've been doing things, you know, I call myself anarchist sometimes. Hey, it's sexy. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I've been, I officially became a member of the libertarian party recently. Um, actually, I've been doing things for them on and off for years. So I just got sick of, of people not checking their facts and actually working out what I'm trying to do. Well, I think you straightened out a little bit there, haven't you? So uh, that's that one sorted. Okay, well, this evening we'll be speaking with Joseph Wages. Joseph is a Freemason and the co-author of the book The Secret School of Wisdom, The Authentic Ritual and Doctrines of the Illuminati. He has been researching the history and works of the famous Bavarian Illuminati for many years, and in this time he has managed to study all their original writings and doctrines and was happy to come on the show and share his thoughts and knowledge. I must confess I, I take Freemasonry very seriously. I'm very, very interested in indeed. Um, oh, everybody knows I've got a thing about being annoyed by the bloody Illuminati. Uh, you know, 
some of our previous guests have already explained roughly what I think. You know, it can, the, the historical group, the be uh, what was it, the Bavarian Illuminati? Yes, I've no trouble with that. Hey, they're all gone. You know, I mean, uh, what's all this other stuff anyway? Young Joe has to tell us what he thinks. Yeah, yeah, you know, it's um, we've made no secret of it that we're not. Um, we don't um, subscribe to all this Illuminati conspiracy out there. In fact, I think it it can actually make a bit of um, the waters are quite muddy, to be honest with you. But um, I was really excited to get Joseph on because I think he's really got stuck into this research. And um, with this subject, I don't think you'll find a lot of people that know more, to be honest. A very talented young man, and I'm sure he's going to give us a very good show indeed. Let's do it. Hello, Joseph. Welcome to THA Talks. Hey, how are you guys doing today? Yeah, no, we're, we're doing very well, thank you. We've, we've been looking forward to having you on the show. Um, okay, so, I mean, the Illuminati, nowadays, most people have heard of them and they associate them with some secret elite that control the world while plotting and controlling. Along with them are the Freemasons, who are seen as some um, malevolent force and that we have the whole sat- satanic worship thing that gets thrown in there as well. Um, it's really out there. Um, I, we'd like to hear your point of view and all that. And um, But first, could you let us know about your background and how you got interested in it all to, to start off with? Oh, certainly. So I've been researching this topic for maybe the last 10 years. And about five years ago, I really started collecting in earnest all the uh, primary source documents. Uh, it led me into uh, contact with Reinhard Markner. He's one of the leading Masonic scholars in Germany. And he has uh, the direct primary access to all the uh, extant papers and the uh, secret state archives and elsewhere about Germany. And so it was through him uh, we really got this project going in earnest. And then uh, we got Jivo on board to translate uh, for us. And you know, so for the last really three years, like it's been uh, really in depth, focused on trying to get you know all these different uh, variations of the manuscripts sorted out, put together. And what we're left with is we're left with a, probably the most accurate and faithful copy of the entire Illuminati ritual system as it was at the uh, end of the order's life. Right, cool. I mean, th- this is really, really cool because, um, I mean, as I say, it's there's so much um, talk of the Illuminati and every conspiracy site you go to, basically the bad guys are always referenced as the Illuminati. Now, I have to say, I mean, I am a, I'm known as a conspiracy guy. I, I, I do sympathise with a lot of conspiracies out there. And I, I do believe myself that there is a, an, a, an elite out there that are pulling a lot of strings at the moment. But that being said, personally, I, I've, I've researched what I can about the Illuminati and I haven't actually got too much of a problem with them. You know, I, I was looking at them, well, hang on, where's the where's the, 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 bad, the bad guy here, you know? So, um, I mean, w- what are your views generally on the Illuminati then with, your, with all the research you've done? Okay, well, so what we're talking about here is we're talking about a factual historical group versus kind of like the... Uh, modern myth and mythology that's kind of developed over the years. So the actual group itself, uh, you know, it was founded in 1776 at Ingolstadt University by Professor Adam Weishaupt and uh, nine of his pupils. And so basically in its early days, it kind of resembles a secret society. And what he was doing was he wanted to have uh, what he referred to as a, a secret school of wisdom. And basically what this school was, was a means of educating his pupils in uh, popular philosophy, science, reason, rationalism, um, and doing all this in kind of a way to uh, – what he wanted to do is to refer society and he was going to accomplish this through education and so really in the illuminati's early days they start out more as a like, kind of like a college fraternity like an honors academic you know something like a phi beta kappa or something like that and then as these guys start graduating and progressing along you know within the first couple of years uh, they start going into freemasonry and then they get this idea though hey we're going to merge uh, the illuminati with freemasonry as a means of spreading the illuminati right because within freemasonry you know candidates are held to like a certain uh you know they, they need to be you know good upstanding people right so it kind of narrows the field of selecting potential candidates for the illuminati and it's already an established institution so they were going to try and graft themselves onto this and the trouble was though is that adam weishaupt he wasn't very advanced in freemasonry he'd only achieved the second degree at this point and it was through uh his association with a guy named baron adolf von Kniga that uh they were able to you know, bring Freemasonry into the fold. So Adam Weishaupt, he writes a small fraction of the actual historical degrees, 
And uh, whereas Baron Adolf von Knigge, he writes uh, the, the bulk of the ritual system, you know, with Vice Ops input, of course. And so what Knigge does, he, he's, he's a member of this pre-existing institution called the Strict Observance. And the Strict Observance were basically strictly observing a Templar origin of Freemasonry. And of course, it was a, a totally spurious idea put out by this guy named Baron Adolf von Hund. And um, so what, what basically they're trying to do is say that, you know, Freemasonry, it comes, it's, it's not started at the Grand Lodge of uh, England in 1717. You know, it presupposes all this and it goes back to the uh, Knights Templar. And it kind of gives a like, mystique and kind of makes it like a, a Christian Masonic order. So that's uh, Kniga's background. And so Kniga, he decides, uh, you know, at the death of bon, Von Hund, uh, they're supposed to be directed by this, these unknown superiors. But the trouble was, is none of these unknown superiors existed at all. And so, you know, there's a lot of like turbulence inside the strict observance. You know, it's it's basically falling apart because, you know, it's quickly been laid bare that, you know, there is no directing unknown superiors of this order. And so you start getting these little fracture groups. Well, Kniga wanted to do uh, a reform of the strict observance, kind of bring it back into the fold. And well, he comes into contact with this guy named the Marquis de Costanzo. And, you know, the Marquis is like, well, hey, why do you want to you know, do this over here? We've already got the institution you're looking for. And so he ascends to the Illuminati and he starts corresponding in short order with Weishaupt. And he's you know, made a collaborator in the whole project. And so he adds on all of the Illuminati symbolic degrees and Scottish degrees. And it's a uh, lowest uh, mystery class degrees, the degrees of uh, priest and regent. And so that's how he gets going in there. And that's kind of, you know, the historical foundation. But what you were asking about also was the conspiracy stuff. So there's two ways to look at this. There's um, there's the historical group and then there's the kind of conspiratorial group. Well, the conspiratorial group, like if there's a contemporary conspiracy, like in the late 18th century, and it stems upon two books. One of them is written by John Robeson called Proofs of a Conspiracy. And the other book is called uh, Memoirs on the History of Jacobinism, and it was written by uh, Augustine Barwell. He was a, an abbey in France. And so basically what these guys were doing is they were repulsed by what had happened in the French Revolution, you know, and rightfully so at the end of it because, you know, with all the uh, Robespierre's and the you know, people being guillotined and everything like that, and then they generally kind of had a de kind of a dechristianizing thing in France. What it was is there was they were trying to basically make it like the Illuminati came over there and they're responsible for all this and see this is what they want to enact on the world and also you know contemporarily at that time in uh, in Scotland like that and also in Ireland they had like the United Irishmen and these little radical groups starting to rise up that were kind of inspired by these French Jacobin clubs and so what it looked like to them is that this whole system was spreading and it's going to be this world uh, you know worldwide revolution type thing to kind of de depose kings. And so that was their kind of their thrust and their uh, thing. And then so if you look at Barrow Wells' impetus on the thing, like he he was inspired by a lot of the dechristianizing stuff, him being an abbey over there in France during the revolution. And so they each of them had their own little things that uh, kind of spurred them along. And it was just the actual publication of a lot of this Illuminati correspondence that uh, really influenced, you know, well, here's the bad guys, right? right? Well, that, that's the contemporary conspiracy theory. Yeah. So we'll fast for, we'll fast forward now, like into the uh, 20th century, and uh, in about you know the 1950s or so in America, the Red Scare is getting going like in full steam, like that. And there was this guy named Emmanuel Josephson, and he wrote this book in 1955 called uh, Roosevelt's Communist Manifesto. And what it talks about in that book is it kind of establishes the modern uh, historical narrative for the Illuminati came to America. Jefferson was an Illuminatus. The obverse of the great seal of the dollar is the seal of the Illuminati. And he was inspired by proofs of a conspiracy. But his motivations were was to tie this whole thing of world revolution, which is what, you know, was kind of uh, they were paranoid about as far as like communism. You know, there's a communist under every bed and that sort of thing. And so that's where. The modern thing comes out of the Red Scare, uh, and then so, so Josephson puts it out in '55. Then uh, Robert Welk is this uh, guy of this. What was that group called? Um, uh, John Birch Society. That's what they're called. And so he kind of puts it into this whole video series where he expands upon it. And then so from the '50s forward, it's the kind of the same message that's put in uh, Roosevelt's Communist Manifesto. And they build on it, and they build on it, and they build on it. And you know, through the generations, everyone's got their own little input and their own little ideas, and it kind of gets grafted onto this narrative to where we have what we have today. Okay. Well, uh, so do you think that the Illuminati are still around today, or, or is there or is there a group that's the 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 next closest thing to what what would be the Illuminati today? 
Well, if we look at like what was going on uh, back in the Illuminati, as far, far as all the correspondence and all the extant records that we have, and they're not totally complete, but they're complete enough to you can definitely see like a, a a slow beginning in like their correspondence, a spike like when they're in full steam, and then like you can see it just drop off a cliff. And like really, the last traces we have of the Illuminati at all are in 1792 in uh, Gotha and Weimar in Germany. And that's pretty much where it all kind of, we just lose all trace of it all together. And really the Illuminati, like they're, uh, you know, Weishaupt, he flees in 1785. And after 1785, he's no longer the head of the Illuminati. So the Southern half of the Illuminati in Germany have been totally cut off, but the Northern half functions and kind of lingers on for a while. But because there's no central direction, uh, they all kind of just kind of, you know, kind of burn out like a candle, I guess. Mm. And, and so what we see is like what, what was left of their symbolic degrees and their Scottish degrees get rolled back into Freemasonry proper. And so that that's really their ultimate fate is they kind of get reabsorbed back into Freemasonry and that's the end of them. Mm, over the over last 100 years or so, there's been a, you know, a lot of the secret orders, a lot of the um, esoteric teachings that are out there and, and magical teachings have been really into the, the mystical Kabbalah. Um, is that something that the Illuminati were into much themselves, or, or was it something else? No, it was actually it was more like reason and rationalism, right? So, what we when we see, look at the uh, late eighteenth century and the Enlightenment, what we see a lot of is a lot of popular philosophy, uh, really the birth of the kind of scientific method, all these things like that. And so, what the Illuminati were is they were in opposition to all these uh, mystical type things. They're all about reason, rationalism, you know. Basically, their goals were were to make mankind happy and to make virtue victorious. So basically, to to help people to be the best they can be, to associate with one another, to raise humanity up. And it's through this education that they're supposedly going to be able to uh, govern themselves without any kind of outside direction. So what it was, it was, it's basically, um, you know, the, the birth of democracy. So like, what's going on back then? If you look at the American Republic. Um, you know, it really doesn't get going in earnest until 1783, and then when the uh, Constitution gets put into place is when really the American Republic starts. So this is all prior to any kind of people's republic that's successfully thrown off their monarch, right? So that's kind of the the uh, ideological background they're operating in. And so what they're talking about doing is really the same thing, and they were influenced to a large extent to what was going on in America and you know that's that that's that's basically the, the the theater that they're operating in. They're trying to basically uh, you know make mankind operate at its highest potential. You know to entrown like reason, virtue, science, uh, good manners. You know that type of thing. Fellowship, brotherhood. You know all of the kind of the buzzwords mm-hmm. of the uh, the Enlightenment. Oh, cool. Well, I mean. Uh We've also got stuff today like the Golden Dawn and Thelema that's developed over the years. Um, also, modern pagan movement, Wicca and, and heathenry and, and so on, that's kind of gone on from all that. I mean, what are your views on, on the Golden Dawn and, and that kind of stuff? Do you think that has also taken a lot of inspiration from the Illuminati or, or Freemasonry? Well, I would say more so the Illuminati. Like, so there's, there's two guys. There's Leopold Engel and there's a guy named Theodore Royce, and they both uh, – you know, like in about the 1880s or so, all these Illuminati papers, they're still all kind of in one place in Bavaria, <clears throat> not, you know, kind of discounting what's held in these different lodge archives. And um, so the, the, they're in Munich and they're able to go and research these papers in their entirety undisturbed. Uh, you know, and all these papers, they get scattered when the Nazis come to power. They get boxed up and sent off. And really, the Germans don't get, you know, they don't get all the papers back. A lot, some of it's destroyed and a lot of it goes to Moscow and comes back in the 1990s. So they're here in the 1880s with everything intact, and they're researching all these papers, and they're influenced by it. But what they were – they weren't influenced so much by the message and, like, the reason and the rationalism because, like, in the late uh, 19th century, you know, it's kind of more like the whole romantic period. And so they're into the more mystical and occult type things. So what they walk into it with is already kind of having, like, an occult and mystical interest and intrigue and so they try to start this group, the New Illuminati, which, you know, it doesn't really go anywhere. And then uh, they kind of break off, and then they go into the Golden Dawn, and it later evolves into the OTO. Mm. But Royce, at this point, it uh, kind of had a falling out with Engel, and so they go forward with it. And so that's kind of like they're influenced by the Illuminati, not so much by the actual ideology, but by the uh, structure and that sort of thing. Right, yeah. Okay, well, David, um, you ready to chip in here? Gosh, I could listen to Joseph for ages. Interesting stuff. Um, It's fascinating stuff. I mean... Paul is more the conspiracy boy than me, I confess that. 
Um, I'm sympathetic to certain types of financial conspiracy. Uh, people conspire. I think that's just a sad fact of human nature. Um, but oh, this, sure. I, yeah, I mean, you know, but conspiracies as the way some people are touting them. I, I don't know. That leaves me quite sort of cold. Joseph, I, I'm interested in exploring a bit about you. I mean, I, I hear you're an avid reader, a collector. I don't know of what yet. And certainly a much more than amateur historian. Um, I also hear that you began this journey after listening to a conspiracy theorist um, who was saying some extraordinary outla and outlandish things about the Illuminati. You did some digging yourself and soon discovered that it wasn't the entire case. I mean, would you care to flesh that out a bit? What spurred you on? Well, I heard I heard a show probably like in the early 2000s, and it was you know the kind of the standard. Uh, the Illuminati came to America. They're running the world right now. It's a global cabal, this, that, and the other. And then somehow or another, it gets lumped into the you know, Council on Foreign Relations. And, you know, it's a new world order they're trying to establish. And I, I don't even remember the show per se. But so they started talking about the Illuminati. And, the, you know, that's really when the Internet was coming into its own. So I started Googling the Illuminati. And the first book it takes me to is Proofs of a Conspiracy. So I go on and get the copy of that book. And I start going through it. And then, so I'm looking at their uh, their sources, right? Because you know, everyone when they write a paper, you know, try as they might, they're going to put a little bit of their influence into it. They're going to put you're going to be able to read what the author's thoughts are. Either you know, the academic text like that, it's supposed to be more like facts and information. But even then, like you can really get a sense of what a person's opinion is just by the way they present and structure things. And so, the, and it was red flags going off, and I was reading the thing. I was like, wow, he's putting a lot of, uh, you know, he's putting a lot of himself and not a lot of facts in this book. And so then I, he started having like underneath it would be the sources of the books while I was reading the titles and they're horribly butchered, uh, you know, German titles. So they don't really they don't really jive. And so that was another red flag. And so at that point, I started kind of going out and collecting all the different, uh, you know, all the different primary sources that were printed in Germany in the late 18th century. And so from that point forward, I, you know, I just started kind of collecting it. And then about five years ago is when I really got going in earnest and I, I started getting access and a lot of these digital books started popping up online. And what I was doing before that was I would hire like a research assistant. I'd, I'd go and I'd find where these books were at in these rare uh, book libraries. And I'd send someone in there with a camera and just photograph all the pages for me. And so as, as these little pieces started coming back to me, you know, it became readily apparent that, you know, really what was in proofs of a conspiracy you know, the, the guy probably didn't speak German at all. It probably had someone yeah. just kind of spoon feeding him information. And then it later became that was actually the fact that there was a spy. I think it was in Regensburg, an English spy like in Germany that was kind of spoon feeding him some of this information. And so he was, you know, he was doing it contemporarily with all the things that were being published in these books. Well, if we look at what was being published against him in Germany, um, it was basically that, you know, these guys are terrible and this that and the other and they were cherry pick cherry picking their correspondence you know because like if someone got into your email box and took every message you had there's more than a few emails that they can find that'll make you look in a negative light and then mm. is that that's what they were doing is they were kind of cherry picking some of these things and putting them out there and that, that's that's kind of what was going on and so it really you know kind of got me going in earnest and so the thing that w that i noticed that was you know the, all these ritual books like that there's you know there was probably most of the ritual was published but not like really the complete ritual some mm -hmm. of it was excerpted some of it you know had emissions and you know the sources that they transposed them from we don't have any of those left but we do have other ritual copies and so you know the first thing we had to do was reassemble all the different ritual books and so we did it in german first and then we went through it and started translating the books out. And so as like the little, because uh, I, I can read German and speak German just fine, but the trouble is, is that we're talking about 18th century German. So it's the mm. it's the difference between like 18th century English versus modern English. You can get what they're saying, but you have to really pay attention and really focus. And there's also differences like in the spelling and just, you know, words that they just generally don't use at all anymore, kind of like in our language as well. Very interesting. I mean, how much of the primary source material have you managed to bring out and how much is there left to be researched? Oh, that, I mean, as far as the ritual stuff, everything that's concerning the system, I mean, I think we've got like 99.9% .9 of all the actual ritual text. Now, as far as correspondence, uh, Reinhardt's on a different group and they do a, a series of books called the uh, 
correspondence of the Illuminati order in English, and they're up to volume two right now. And I think they're in 1782 is where they've left off. So the you know the first few years of the Illuminati's existence is very sparse, and so they're able to get 1776 to 1781 all in or the first half of 1781 into one book and then they've got 1781 to 1782 in another book and basically every book that comes out it's all the existing letters like internal correspondence all the the significant things and so what's interesting about it is a lot of the extant papers are just the high level people because you know low level people probably wouldn't keep very good records probably wouldn't keep these papers they'd just be lost to time but fortunately a lot of these upper level guys you know they have archives of their correspondence and Reinhardt took it even a step further. So the stuff that's not held at institutions, he'll go out and he'll you know research family archives and dig a lot of these things out. So I mean, it's it. What we're looking at here is you know we we've handled one aspect of it as far as like the actual ritual itself and the correspondence. A lot of it's just it's kind of like what was going on day to day within the context of the order, and so it's really it's really kind of a neat project. And so you know this really this this whole field and discipline in the English language is just now opening up. And so there's going to be plenty of opportunities for people to kind of pick up where we left off. All we did was establish what the Illuminati were, what was their ritual system like, what were their goals, and that sort of thing. Absolutely fascinating. Um, I, I was interested in your clarification about what the Illuminati were. I mean, I tend to have a very down-to-earth view of it all. I mean, you know, Illuminati is a name that covers so many things. I mean, the actual historical Bavarian Illuminati and absolutely fictitious groups. Um you are a practicing Freemason yourself. May I ask you that? Oh, absolutely. Right. So, I mean, I'm asking that for one simple reason. I think the work of Alistair Crowley, um, a problematic but ingenious man, can't really be understood, and I don't mean this in a negative sense, can't really be, un you know, the symbols, the intentions, the, the mystical formula, can't really be understood outside Freemasonry. I think he becomes monstrous when, when he's removed from that overall system do you think therefore that maybe the illuminati as they were dispersed or, or passed into other things survive in their ritual system and does that ritual system still influence people like say the crowleys of the world okay well th there's there's a couple different ways to answer that one let's first start with the context of freemasonry so within the context of freemasonry the illuminati remember i mentioned they came out of the strict observance and so uh, as that group fell apart there was different little ideas well there's a guy named uh, jean baptiste villermos who did this thing that later became the rectified scottish rite now the rectified scottish rite is kind of what they run in a lot of germany parts of france in different places like that in kind of western europe that sort of ritual systems working well it's very close to the symbolic degrees that the Illuminati were working anyways. Mm -hmm. And what it does, what it is really is that <clears throat> it's not so much that one's influenced by the other, but they're both influenced by the strict observance and kind of what was popular going on back then. So symbolically, there's a lot of similarities to it. Now, the Illuminati, on the other hand, though, they, they modified a lot of the modes of recognition, catechisms, and things like that to make it peculiar to their institution. So that way, um, it was kind of their way of seeing like who was a member of their institution or not, right? So they, they had a the appearance of being an authentic and ancient Masonic system, but they also had things that were peculiar to them. So that, that way, if someone was visiting from another lodge, you'd know right off the bat if they were an Illuminatus or they weren't. And that's that's that was kind of their their mode going forward with that. So as far as like Freemasonry goes, they they also had in the uh, Scottish Knight degree and in the Priest degree, uh, one of the highest degrees that was going on in France at that point in time was the thing called Knights Rosa Croix, mm -hmm. and uh, they had elements of that ritual in the Scottish Knight degree and in the Priest degree to give it like a the appearance of also being inspired from the same high degree type system, it, you know, further elements of legitimacy in it. So the reader will, will, you know, obviously pick up on all these different little elements. And I think we've even noted them in the book as well. And you'll, you'll, uh, you'll basically get the sense that, you know, that there are some authentic thing, but the trouble was, is that they weren't an authentic Masonic system at all. And that's real. And really they were irregular. So mm. like within Freemasonry, you're supposed to have uh, a warrant and a charter authorizing you to work, right? And it's supposed to come from a Grand Lodge. Well, the Illuminati initially secured a, a, a charter to basically start constituting sister lodges, right? But mm. it was a very expensive system, and they didn't want to do that. So they just they broke free from Berlin altogether, 
and started ch- chartering lodges under their own authority, which is a Masonic no-no. And so it made them a totally irregular system. So th- they not only have pressure now from the uh, public, but they also have pressure Masonically, right? So a lot of the uh, conspiratorial type things that they were doing were actually within the context of Freemasonry itself, you know, kind of spying on other systems, copying their ritual books. And like if members wanted to uh, know about another system, well, they pretty much already had all their rituals archived. And they were able to read these other systems without joining them. So it was a means of like retaining members, but also gaining intel on other systems. So the most conspiratorial things they did in their life were actually within the context of Freemasonry, if you can believe that. Mm. I mean, I, 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 that's absolutely, gosh, that's intriguing. I mean, I'm quite a, a supporter of Freemasonry. I think it's done immense good in the world. Um, and without Freemasonry, you don't really get countries like Holland, which are places where you'd want to live. Um, so, you know, I'm generally exploring all this. I, I don't know what I think about Illuminism. Let's get to that, uh, Joe. What do you think Illuminism actually is? Is it just the light of reason? I mean, I can't remember whether it's true or not. Somebody told me that some of the Illuminatists wanted to destroy Rome with light. And I thought, gosh, that could mean so many things. It could mean reason. You know, it could mean research. I mean, I keep asking Paul if he's an Illuminatus, but he keeps saying yes, but I think that's too easy. Um, (laughs) What would it mean? What would it mean to be an Illuminatus, do you think? Okay, well, let's step one step back there. So Illuminati, all it means is like enlightened, right? And within the context of the order, um, the first people called the Illuminati were the Alumbrados of Spain. They were kind of like a Christian mystical sect in the 1500s. You know, flash forward another hundred years, you have the Illuminis of Avignon, also a Christian Christian mystical sect. And then so the Illuminati, they they were using that name because like when people were first baptized in the early Christian church and had taken communion, they were called Illuminati, right? Which just means they were enlightened. And it you know, they reference some uh, in the ritual text, they reference some of the early Christian fathers within the context of it. And so the Illuminati has the appearance of being a an authentic Christian order even though it really wasn't that. And if we look at like kind of the spiritual undertones of the whole thing, you know, Adam Weishaupt and a lot of the, the high ranking members of the Illuminati were more of deists and less, uh, mm. you know, less Christians, maybe like, maybe like Christian deists, if that makes any sense. And mm. so what they re- what they, 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 what they were against was kind of a literal interpretation of the Bible, right? Because any kind of literal interpretation of anything leads to, to fanaticism, uh, you know, and rightfully so, because if you look at even, you know, with Jesus himself, he teaches in parables, metaphors, you know, allegory, that sort of thing. That's his strongest teaching devices. Mm. And so that's what they're saying in here. And so when you're talking about they want to destroy Rome with light, what what, what they're talking about is, uh, you know, within the context of that is that, you know, don't make everything a little interpretation. And also they were against a lot of like some of the uh, Catholic ceremonies and whatnot, as far as like them being, you know, just total inventions that had nothing to do with mm. the original Christian church. And that's what they're, so it's, is not within the context of Protestantism necessarily as in the, the context of like, you know, you guys are inventing stuff here that doesn't exist, which is ironic because they were inventing an entire Masonic system. Yeah. So it's, <laughs> it's kind of hypocritical, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> oh, the, the layers of, of fiction are in, intriguing me. You're, you're an authority, young man. Um, deism. I, I suppose I'm some sort of deist. Uh, I just can't see why we've always got to surrender poetry and the arts. Um, I suppose most people would also agree that deism began in England. That's a little debatable. I mean, is deism the real secret of the Illuminati, do you think? Is it the secret of Freemasonry? No, I see with, with Freemasonry proper, when it starts out like that, it's actually more of a Christian institution than one might think. You know, mm-hmm. if we go back to the uh, the working medieval stone guilds like that, these are the guys that are building cathedrals, you know, castles, whatnot like that. You know, houses to God, right? And, yeah. you know, really the secrets of Freemasonry are like – are just like the, the craft secrets of like how to, how to build a building without like complex math, using geometry and things like that. So that's where it kind of starts out to mm-hmm. – well, then as like, you know, less and less things are being built, they transform into a speculative institution. So by – and that starts happening even as much as like the 1640s, you know, 1650s, right after the Civil War. So by 1717, when the Grand Lodge of England is founded, uh, what we see is we get – uh, we get really like Freemasonry as a speculative institution, and that sort of thing kind of carries along uh, to where we're at today. 
Gosh, I mean, as I say, I'm a supporter overall of Freemasonry. I have described it in the press as the Rotary Club with rituals, which is a compliment, by the way. The Rotary Club do a great deal of good work. Um, oh, I've got to touch on one conspiracy, I suppose. Um, I did some digging and found that you had unearthed letters between the Illuminati and American notables like Benjamin Franklin and John Adams. Um, would you care to flesh that out? And where, where are we going with that? Oh, certainly. So w what I was researching at that point in time was, you know, what did, did the Illuminati have any influence in America? Did they even try to come here? Because we're all familiar that, you know, the conspiracy narrative as laid out in uh, uh, Roosevelt's Communist Manifesto by Emanuel Josephson in 1955, it states that the Illuminati came to America and went forward. Well, going through uh, the correspondence of you know Reinhardt's book that I mentioned before, uh, I came across where they, they mentioned that they had this project called Elysium, you know, which in you know in Roman antiquity the Elysium field was kind of like the equivalent of heaven, like where you wanted to go in the afterlife, and so they called Elysium was their project name for America. And so, like, as a background, like in the 1780s, there's only maybe a couple hundred members at most at this point, and they're really limited to kind of, uh, you know, Munich, Ingolstadt, and some of the surrounding towns around there. And so, they're, they're reading about in their newspapers all the things that are going on with the American Revolution, and they're totally sympathetic, right, because they want to, you know, put the uh, People's Republic into place and do it through education, and they're big supporters of it. So, there's a faction within the Munich Illuminati that are wanting to immigrate to the United States. And so one of the little side uh, ideas is this project called Elysium. And what they want to do is they want to uh, they want to colonize some some land in Germany. Well, there's this group like in the uh, 1730s called, uh, what were they called? The Salzburgers. And it's uh, situated in South Carolina and Georgia. They're separated between this thing called the Savannah River. And so on one side is Ebenezer, Georgia, and on the other side is Perrisburg, South Carolina. And so they were looking at those two cities as possibles and also maybe Augusta, Georgia, further up the Savannah River. And so what they wanted to do was get some land over there and set up their thing because, you know, if we look at what's going on in Germany, Germany, you know, it's a part of the decaying Holy Roman Empire. And all the ed education is controlled by Jesuits, you know, up to about 1775. But for all intents and purposes, there's still a whole lot of censorship. You know, they really haven't come into their own yet. And so they want ideological freedom. And, you know, what better place than go to America? So what they do is, is they write these letters. Uh, one of them they write to John Adams. The other one they write to Benjamin Franklin. And one goes to uh, Philadelphia, which, you know, we're guessing is the, the Continental Congress, but we're not certain of it because we can't find that letter. But the uh, the Adams and the Franklin letter, they're, they're identical copies. You know, the only thing that's different is the uh, ambassador's name. And so Adams and Franklin, they're serving as envoys in Paris in 1780 uh, to France. And so they write letters to him, and they're basically asking for a square mile of fallow land, liberty of conscience, and can we do all these things like that? And if you guys will agree to it, you know, you'll have you know, you know, useful and obedient uh, citizens, and you know, this, that, and the other. But they also want uh, total control of their own internal domestic affairs. And so what it is is that they're putting the, their feelers out. Can we get a hold of this land? Can we go there? But the trouble is, it doesn't pan out for them because the place that they pick. You know, first off, they said they want a square mile of fallow land in a healthful and fertile country. Well, the trouble is with this is that uh, where they picked, you know, Perisburg and Ebenezer on this part of the Savannah River, it's pretty much a swamp for all intents and purposes. Mm. So you really can't call it healthful. And if you've ever been to those areas in the summertime like that, I mean, it's oppressively hot, 100 percent humidity. And so, you know, it wasn't the best of places for them to pick. But none of that stuff even mattered because the British at the Battle of Charleston in 1780 captured the entire southern half of the United States and cut it off from you know being a viable actor in the war you know for the for the for the remaining year or so of hostilities that were going on and so that's what the whole irony of this whole situation is the, yeah they had a plan it only existed in 1780 um, and we only have like you know three or four letters referencing it still um, but we know who they sent letters to and I was actually able to find the Adams letters and the uh, Franklin letter. And the, you know, not even the uh, German guys had even found that one yet. And the reason they hadn't found it is because the Illuminati were writing of, under a pen name of Kempton Strauss. And so mm -hmm. I was just looking for, you know, I was looking through these guys' correspondence that year, 1780, you know, in May. And that, that's how I was able to come across it. And so they were written in French. 
Um, that, and you know, really, that's how we know anything about that plan at all. But we do know that it didn't work out for them. One, because I've checked all the biographical stuff and all the genealogical stuff I can for both of the towns. There's no one's name in there, and plus no one leaves uh, to go over there. There's only like one or two guys that we know of that were ever members of the Illuminati that ever came to America uh, ever. And so that's what was so interesting about the whole thing is that, you know, yeah, there was a kernel of truth to that, but it wasn't founded on the truth. It was founded on speculation. And in fact, what was going on in the early American Republic, there was this guy named Elihu Palmer. So, there, you know, there, if you look at the papers and things that were going on back then, there were most definitely was some kind of activity that was really getting people going, you know, in the 1790s, early 1800s. And what it was it was this guy named Elihu Palmer, who was this, you know, former uh, preacher, but he lost a couple bunch of pulpits because uh, he was kind of preaching liberal thoughts, and he was he was for all intents and purposes a deist himself. And so what he was doing was he was kind of agitating. Well, he he comes into contact with this guy named John Fitch, who was the inventor of the steamboat, and uh, Fitch has this debating club called the Universal Society, and you know it was really a deist club, but he invited like you know people of other faiths there to 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 you know give their little piece and give their lecture and so he makes he runs across elihu palmer and elihu palmer gives this lecture against the divinity of jesus to their club well the guys in the club really like it a whole lot well palmer's emboldened and he goes and takes an advertisement out in the newspaper that says you know a lecture sunday evening next against the divinity of jesus and you can probably <laughs> imagine about how <laughs> about how well that was received <laughs> so, so, yeah, so long story short, they bar him from entering the place, and uh, he's you know he's run out of town, and so he goes and well he's he's a sophist for the most part, so you know what can he practice if you're if you're not practicing some kind of preaching, well we might as well go into law, right? Yeah. And so he starts reading law in Western Pennsylvania, and then in 1793 he gets the the yellow fever and it kills his wife and it strikes him blind. Well, he tries to go back practicing law right after that, it doesn't work out for him. And uh, so he, he sends his kids off to live with his parents, and he starts traveling around. So he acts like a preacher again, but he's evangelizing for deism. So he, he'll he'll go and spend some time in a town and then get ran off just about as quickly as he starts something there. And so you see all this activity going around, and what it is is it's this blind former preacher. And like, and he was doing some vile stuff like as far as like just against the uh, divinity of the scriptures, against everything Christian or any, any faith for that matter. And uh, he writes this book, Principles of Nature, and he gets this lady to write it down for him. He sends a copy to Jefferson, uh, you know, that kind of thing. And so the, really all the uh, activity that's going on in the early American Republic right at the same time that proofs of a conspiracy comes out. Mm -hmm. And in fact, he mentions uh, the Illuminati in his book, Principles of Nature. So you can tell that he's also read proofs of a conspiracy or had it read to him. And so he's influenced by all these ideas. And so what's going on in the in the um, in the early American Republic is this guy, you know, this one guy, Elihu Palmer, starting these deist clubs all over the place and getting rain out of town. So he has to go to the next town to do the same thing. And so that's that's what that's what was going on. <laughs> and that's what's so interesting about this whole thing is that you know we see a contemporary conspiracy and a modern conspiracy. And if we look at the whole field, everyone's putting their own little ideas into it, their own influences, their own biases. And it's just natural. It's it's what people do. And so, you know, when you kind of when you take that for granted as a fact and start filtering through the sources like that and then start putting them all together and laying all the pieces out, you can see what's really going on here. And if you divorce yourself from like your own preconceived notions and just say, OK, you know, my opinions aside, what's going on here? What can you establish from it? And that's really how, you know, I've arrived to where we're at today. Wow. Um, I, one, one of my heroes is Thomas Jefferson, I, an extraordinary man, a feat of play, yes, but an extraordinary man. Um, and I'm a constitution worshipper. I'm on the wrong side of the pond to say that, but I'm a constitution worshipper. <laughs> one, one last thing before Paul punches me and gets me off the air, because he knows I want to talk to you, Joe, so you'll have to forgive me. Uh, you know, I'm interested in the fact you've isolated the fictitious side of all of this. I mean, it's a well-known so, fact in literature that, you know, fiction often serves hidden truths or or very subtle and complex truths. Do you think any of that's gone on with this, or is it simply works of fancy masquerading as something else? You know, we're not talking about the historical Illuminati, but those fictitious groups that constantly recur bearing that name. Oh, oh, well, sure. I mean, uh, let, let's, let's, I'll isolate one for you real quick here. So there's a guy named William Guy Carr, and in 1949, he writes this book called Pawns of the Game. And in Pawns of the Game, he claims that Albert Pike is the head of the Illuminati, and so he <laughs> supposedly has 
Yeah, he he has this letter from Giuseppe Mazzini, and uh, you know, the, well, they're talking about three world wars and this, that, and the other. Well, here's the interesting part about it. So, one, uh, William Guy Carr, he totally makes up the existence of this letter. It's not in the uh, British archives. I forget which archive it was exactly, but you know, it's never been in there. It's never been entered. So it's not that it went missing. It didn't exist. Uh, so he makes this whole fabricated story up. And so what he he's influenced by Leo Taxel's, uh, uh, you know, the kind of, yeah, the, the, the whole, like uh, the whole, uh, devil worshiping Freemason stuff like that. So that comes from Leo Taxel, like in the 1880s and 1890s. And so he, he's playing off of some of that information. And so he, he totally makes up this three world wars letter thing. And so what's interesting is, so he writes it in 1949, right? Well, we've already had the first world war. We've already had the second world war. So, you know, it stands to reason that, you know, surely there's going to be a third world war at some point because there's always going to be a war. And so there wasn't very prophetic about it, but he kind of ties his whole thing in there influenced by Taxel about the, you know, that we're going to destroy uh, Christianity and then we're going to destroy uh, atheism and we're going to put in the pure doctrine of Lucifer because that's what he was reading into in the Taxel stuff. And so that's what's so funny about the whole thing. <laughs> well, T Taxel's an extraordinary man, but for all the wrong reasons, I better get, I better give up my, my stance. Paul, my dear, welcome back. What do you want to ask this remarkable young man? Uh, well, there's one one thing that was um, on my mind um, as I was listening to that. I, I got a bit curious about uh, regarding the Illuminati. Do you think there was much of an athe atheistic philosophy um, in the group? Well, it, so with the, when the Illuminati, the, one of the first things that's published on them is the thing called Some Original Writings in English, and it's published in 1787. And so there's a there's a piece on there. Uh, and I think this is probably the origin of where it's going with. There's a piece on there called Better Than Horus or The Seven Hows and Whys. Mm. And like in the in the uh, description of it, it says a piece where atheism and materialism are defended, right? Well, that yeah. was like a very intriguing and attractive thing for me to go find. I wanted to go say, okay, well, what's the root of this atheism? What's the root of this materialism? Well, I was able to track down at a, a German university, I was able to track down an original copy of it. And this is before the, the, I think there's a copy of it now that's on uh, Google Books, but it's not the original one. It's it was done a few years later, and the reason is because the book it's written uh, backwards, right? So the characters read like you're reading normally from left to right, but if you read the words, it reads from right to left, and so it was kind of a chore. So I, I transposed it backwards, and then translated the whole document, and it became quickly clear that what they weren't talking about atheism, they were talking about deism. So it's it was a misnomer. And so probably that's where some of the ideas have run from, but really, like if you had to if you had to pin down uh, the Illuminati like that, you know, maybe more like Christian deism or maybe even just pure deism. It really it's kind of ambiguous, and everyone had their own different opinions. And you know, there there are also many Christian followers, but what we do know about the makeup of the Illuminati is that they had to at least be a Christian or, or raised in the Christian faith, so they weren't accepting Jews or atheists or anything like that. So that's the historical group. Now, the conspiracy stuff, on the other hand, you know, people have run with it, like, you know, inspired by Taxel and whatnot that, you know, oh, they're devil worshipers, you know, 666, the Mark of the Beast, all that weird stuff. And it kind of just carries over today. And, you know, what's interesting about it is if you look at all these different, uh, you know, the Grammys and all, all these different little things like that, they're putting like, you know, so-called occultic things in there. And people are like, look, it's an Illuminati ritual. I was like, well, one. Now that you have the ritual book, you'll be able to safely say that that's not the case. But furthermore, what you'll look at is, you know, they're they're playing off of people's fears and they're playing off people's things as a viral marketing scheme. Like if you ever go into Google Trends and you type in the word Illuminati and look how it compares and then just put in other things like that, compare Illuminati to Freemasonry, Illuminati to like really anything. And it's like one of the hottest uh, topics, right? So from a viral marketing standpoint, if you were out there and you're trying to get the most attention for your band or, you know, whatever the case might be, you try and, you know, kind of put forward some of that stuff, right? So you get some of these music videos that have this weird Egyptian stuff in it, and they put all these like just bizarre things in there, and it's on purpose, and it's to get people talking about it, it's to get people thinking about it, because it's one of the most devastatingly effective means of marketing there is, right? Right, yeah. No, yeah, that, that makes sense. Um. I mean, one of the, one of the reasons that got me thinking on, on atheism is because I just think there's in in well, it seems to me in society at the moment there's quite a, a, a big agenda to um, I, I I think it's to attack spiritualism through making people pretty fed up of religion. You know, whether it's because of all the wars and the the violence that people are shown that are supposedly 
built up through religion and then also you know you're getting a lot of Christians that are kind of um, I kind of almost feel sorry for them sometimes because they're really bullied and sort of um, exposed and people I really have a good time laying into them and, and sort of attacking religion and what I've noticed is is it's kind of a good way for people to attack spirituality because it, it's almost like there's these debates on was was God the creator of the universe or was this the creator or, or did it did it did it was it created in another way and the way they debunk the concept of something creating the universe is just to debunk Christianity or debunk Islam and then they feel that they're debunking that concept do you know what I mean um, do you find um, I mean where where would you say the Illuminati or even Freemasonry Freemasonry for that matter would, would what what fence would you what side of the fence would they would they sit on with that argument Okay, well, if you'll take my book, right? Well, let's look at the Rex degree. The Rex degree is the uh, top degree in the Illuminati system, and basically what they do is they prove uh, – no, sorry, this is the Docetus degree, the second highest. So they basically prove the immortality of the soul, the existence of God, and like the presence of an afterlife using logical, secular reasoning, and not just from like a materialistic standpoint, but just from like a – I don't know, like to just – they're, but what they're getting at is they're getting at that, you know, there has to be a first cause of things. There has to be like that. Now, necessarily, is it literally what's in the scriptures? Who's to say? They're not they're not approaching it from that angle. They're just doing it from a rationalistic uh, standpoint, and that's where they're going forward with it. And that's their point of view. Now, as far as like Freemasonry itself, you know, all it requires is that it, is it a belief in a higher power than yourself, belief in God, right? Now, what name you put on God, whether he's Muhammad, Jesus, you know, uh, Yahweh, whatever you want to call God, whatever name you call him, it's important to have a belief in something higher than yourself, right? And that's that's the that's the prerequisite. So, um, you know, like I said before, Christianity or Christianity and Freemasonry were very closely linked in the early days, like that. But it was uh, softened down to where it will accept all men of faith, right? Because the whole idea is it, Freemasonry itself is a club for self-improvement, right? So you're not just trying to improve one segment of society. You want to improve society as a whole, right? right. And so that's that's the reason why that was done. Okay, well, I've got a couple more points. Um, um, the Knights Templar, I mean, a lot of people think that basically they were the Freemasons and, and you know, they kind of, a, a bit like the um, the Illuminati, they... they um, disbanded for 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 certain reasons and then uh or did they you know they just became the just became <laughs> the freemasons and um, what are your views on that well like i said before there's like the, there's the liturgy and there's there's a guy named uh there's a guy named ramsey like he gives this oration in france and this is and it's like in the i think it's in the 1740s or the early 1750s i can't remember the exact date but he gives this oration where basically you know just like in a few lines he just happens to casually throw out there that you know really the founders of freemasonry are the knights templar right and that's all it said about it well it gets the whole speculation going right so this baron von hund guy he's uh, initiated by this guy uh, the so-called knight of the red feather and you know some people say it was bonnie prince charlie himself some you know the the jury's out on that one and no one can really establish anything on that. So he's initiated into this order like in the 1750s, but he doesn't start anything with a strict observance until the early 1760s, right? So if it's a viable institution, you know, what, what was going on in the, that 10 years period to, or prior to that? And so what I'm getting at is, is that basically the whole concept of the Knights Templar and Freemasonry, yes, there was an association with it, but it wasn't a legitimate association. It was – uh. Really, like it was kind of like the whole like Jacobite type of Freemasonry is what they call it, and basically it's a, a means of like raising up a Catholic army to put uh, the you know the Stuarts back on the throne is what 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 a lot of the inspiration was like in the seventeen uh, forties and seventeen fifties. You know, that's one vein of it, but um, really that's it's it's kind of a whole spurious association. So the, the, the what I'm getting at is like if the if the thing you're trying to affect is to put the Stuarts back on the throne and raise up an army for them, right? Well, you know, the Knights Templar, like, you know, it, you know, pretty much since they were disbanded, you know, everybody recognizes they were pretty much done wrong here. I mean, they had all their property stolen. They were all killed, you know, burned at the stake. And it was, you know, just for a little infighting, you know, part of the reason might be that they loaned quite a bit of money to Philip the Fair. And, you know, what better way to, to not pay back your debts than to kill your debtor? And so that was kind of his whole inspiration. So, you know, throughout history, people have recognized that these guys were done wrong. And so if you're trying to raise up this Christian army, uh, to put the uh, stewards back on the throne, you know, one of the things you'd want to do is have like a Christian association. So they use the Knights Templar within the context of Freemasonry to go forward with this, right? Now, that's that's the ideological background, but, you know, because it's an institution invented by Baron von Hund, it takes its own legs and runs its own 
uh, kind of runs its own course. And so it quickly loses a connection with the original idea and just becomes kind of like a, a, a top down utopian type thing like that to reform society, but from the other end of it. So the Illuminati are bottom up and the uh, strict observance were top down. And the Illuminati comes out of the strict observance because the strict observance had about a thousand something members that went into the Illuminati system. And so when we're talking about the Knights Templar itself like that, you know, it's a total, totally spurious idea. And it was used, you know, people have different motivations for incorporating things like that. And so it's original motivation was you know to raise up an army to put the stewards back on the throne but you know within a few years of that it totally loses sight of that so by the 1760s when von hun gets the strict observance going in earnest it's less about that and more about being like kind of like a top-down uh christian utopian type thing like that within the context of freemasonry all right yeah well okay you know that's that's really cool thanks for that um one one big thing. I mean, a lot of the conspiracy theorists now listening will 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 be will be thinking this, and it's. I mean, I know there's probably a lot of answers to it and a lot of reasons for it, but why the secrecy with? I mean, with with uh, the Illuminati initiation and with Freemasonry, what is the the big reason for the secret? Would you say? Okay, I got a great answer for that one, and actually, it's also repeated in the Illuminati's ritual book. Okay, so. When we think about like what is the purpose of secrecy, right? Like if we'll look at like at a board, a CEO, you know, is sitting on a board of directors meeting like that. You know, they take minutes, they record what's going on, but everything that's said within the context of that meeting is kept private. So the the purpose of secrecy within that within that institution is to basically to have you know where people can have like candid and open dialogues and discussions about you know matters pertaining to that group, right? Well, within the context of free, within the context of Freemasonry, and also like what the Illuminati recognize this idea as well. The purpose of secrecy really is, uh, you know, twofold. One, to keep you know honest and open dialogue. But the main reason for it is that you know secrecy itself, you know, the the necessity of it in within the context of Freemasonry is that it gives value to ideas. So if in Freemasonry they're trying to you know help you give you the tools to become a better person, you know, and to do it yourself, to make yourself a better person. Um, If they were like, say, let's take the, uh, the golden rule, right. You know, do to others as you would have them do unto you profound truth, very simple. But so if it's, but if it's, if it's so, uh, you know, profound, why isn't it widely practiced? Why isn't it said? And so the point is, if you take this idea, you know, do to others as you would have them do unto you, you, you kind of put a, a, a layer of like secrecy, uh, some pageantry on top of it like that, it gets the candidate hanging on every last word mm-hmm. that he says. And so what it does, the actual uh, the actual point of secrecy is to give value to something. And that's what and, – and really that's what it is. Like so even with – you can read about all the Freemasonic ritual right now. Like you can get on Google and look up all three degrees and read about it. But it's not the same thing as having the actual experience yourself because there's no value to the things that you're learning. Mm-hmm. And it's actually the experience itself, the initiatic process that gives value to these profound secrets. So it's not that we're secretly plotting to do anything bad. What the purpose of the secrecy is, is to have like an initiatic experience with value so that the lessons taught to the candidate are fully absorbed and fully appreciated for what they are and so and it guarantees that it'll uh, it'll 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 speak to his heart to speak to his soul to to make him uh, want to improve himself mm, uh, very well said um, and of course with a lot of the um imposing people out there is also the case of mind your own business <laughs> <laughs> well david i think we're pretty much getting to that point now but is there anything you'd like to throw in the mix before we wrap it up i suppose just one last thing i mean I- because we're, we're slowly getting Freemasonry into this. Joe, you must come back on the show so we can have a proper discussion yeah, absolutely. about it's, it's Freemasonry at some point. Well, I mean, he's such an amazing oh, sure. guest. I mean, we've got to get him back on. Um, I mean, my first exposure to, to Freemasonry was Frank of Frank's Cafe in Fairham in Hampshire. Um, I didn't know what a chocolate sandwich was. I was a very innocent boy until I met Frank. Um, so no all freemasons are high-minded um that's a joke by the way um it strikes me a lot it strikes me a lot of them are perhaps an un an unusually high number where is all this idealism going i mean it's important we have ideals in our life is the inspiration if we take it for argument's sake as a good thing of the illuminati still present and why should we retain an interest in it 
Okay. Well, as far as like the Illuminati, no, they're not present anymore. Why is it important? Well, one, let's look within the context of the uh, – within the conspiracy culture, right? So within conspiracy culture, basically they're the penultimate bad guy, right? But if you think mm-hmm. about it, that's kind of a disempowering idea because if you're trying to affect change, you know, for whatever change you might be trying to, to enact on this earth, uh, whatever it is that motivates you for any kind of meaningful reform, if you've got your target, po- if you've got your crosshairs pointed at the wrong target at a fictitious thing, you're basically chaf- chasing after a soap bubble, and as soon as you pop it, it vanishes like a vapor, right? Mm. So that's why part of it's, and also maybe it's a lesson in psychology too that you know if you want to find out about something like that, you know, research it, do everything you can. Uh, you know, improve yourself, better yourself, learn everything you can about a subject, you know, flesh out everything and don't go into an idea with a preconceived notion. Mm-hmm. Look at it, adjust, you know, your facts as they're fit by the evidence. And that's really kind of where I think that there's value to researching all this. Now, as far as Freemasonry goes like that, Freemasonry, like I said, is a club for self-improvement. It's not a club for everybody because not everybody can commit themselves to being the best person they can be. And mm-hmm. I don't stand here, you know, tritely saying that I'm better than this, that, and the other, blah, blah, blah. That's not it at all. I'm totally flawed. I'm just like every other individual. And so are all Freemasons. We're not specifically better than anybody else like that. The difference is, is that we're, you know, we're trying to improve ourselves to be the best people that we can be. And so from that aspect, you know, self-improvement is always a good thing. I can't, you know, I can't think of any reason why someone wouldn't want to try and better themselves, just, just in my opinion, though. I think that's a wonderful answer. I've got to take you to Soho in London when you're across here. Then we can both cry into our beer and you'll see what, what the counter argument to that would be. No, we've got to strive to be the best we can possibly ever be. Paul, on that, height, on that high-minded note, that's me for the evening. Yeah, well, it's been great having you on, Joseph, and uh, I think David and I can certainly relate to a lot of what you're saying because we are both into Wicca and and we're paganism, and um, I think a lot of that has come from Freemasonry. It's it's derived from that or been inspired by it. So we can. It's been really interesting hearing your perspective on on that and um, your feelings on it. Um, And yeah, it would be great to have you back on to sort of focus on um, one given topic that we can get really get stuck into. Oh, yeah, I'd love the opportunity, guys. Just so whenever you want to schedule it, just go ahead and give me a ring and we'll get it done. Excellent. Well, is there anything you'd like to let our listeners know about before uh, before we go? Oh, absolutely. So in the UK, if you want to get a copy of The Secret School of Wisdom, uh, probably the best places to go are Amazon.co.uk or maybe is it UK.co? I can't remember. And then uh, Lewis Masonic is a good one for you. Now in the U.S., if you want to get a copy of the book, you can go to McCoy's Publishing. That's McCoy.com or Amazon.com. And if you would like any, uh, you know, personalized copy, and I've also got, you know, faithful reproductions of all the Illuminati's regalia. You know, just even do a little window shopping, see what it was that, you know, what was their ornamentation and whatnot. Uh, you can go to my website, uh, IlluminatiRegalia.com. And that's pretty much it. Excellent. Well, um, I shall definitely be doing that, and um, I'm sure some of our listeners will as well. Um, it's been great, and um, we hope to speak to you soon. Well, thanks, guys. I really appreciate the opportunity, and I had a lot of fun. That was Joseph Wages. A very, very interesting young man and an advocate for Freemasonry while being an authority on the Illuminati. It's interesting to get some insights into real, some really well researched insights onto that because I do think it was it's a bit of a misunderstood um, thing, the Illuminati and all around that. You know, people generalize the name and make it out to be they're the guys, they're the bad guys, they're doing this and that. And uh, even if you are a, a conspiracy theorist and you and you do want to expose certain elites. I think if you're going down that road, you're going down the wrong, in my opinion, you're going down the wrong direction. That's what I think. Well, as I'm, you know, but as I said during the interview, the word Illuminati covers a, a multitude of errors these days. I mean, the Bavarian Illuminati were no doubt a historical group, and we can all argue till the cows come home about what they were doing and why. Mm. But all these other Illuminati groups, you know, I think there's an interesting element to fiction and how people want fiction to become reality how they make it reality but at the end of the day a lot of this is fictitious only 
on the level of fancy and nothing else. Absolutely. But um, I, I do like to um, make it clear, though, to our audience. I, I, as I said, I am a believer that I do think there is conspiracy. There's um, the Bilderberg meetings and so on. I think there's a lot of corruption within there. And I think there are a lot of people looking after their own interests and there are agendas going on. But I think it's not as simple as just a group of people around one table. I think there's probably a lot going on at the same time. And uh, I've got a slightly different view of it, a bit more composed with it all. You can't just jump on top of every conspiracy. Um, I keep saying it, I know, but it's. I think it's quite important because if you do want to really affect and change um, what's going on in the world, you can't just... Um, be so easily manipulated by any conspiracy that's thrown out on the internet and if you listen to people like Joseph he's actually got some very good research I mean we may not agree with everything whether it's whatever conspiracies everyone's got their different opinions but he's got some very well researched knowledge on the Illuminati Freemasonry um, and I think you've got to check that stuff out Paul my dear as I said I wish you hadn't said that about the Bilderbergers we're actually in discussions about them coming on the show well you know um, they're, so, they're, it's, it's, Bilderbergers, do not listen to Paul Hobartelli on this evening show. Um, I did look, say some. I said some. <laughs> not all. People conspire. That's human nature. A sad fact of the existential. But the point is, we're not all corrupt and terrible. And I refuse to believe the world is an unrepentantly dreadful place where violence and conspiracy rules everything. I refuse to admit it. And oh. I refuse to believe it. Well, I warmed to what you said purely on the basis that it was positive and I like the sound of it. So how's about that? <laughs> oh, we, 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 we agree on lots, you know we do. Oh yeah, we have our moments, we certainly do. But anyway, coming up on the show, we've got uh, Tom Rosal that's coming on the show, Heathenry, a docu- documentary maker, talented guy. Um, that should be an interesting one. Also got Andrew Goff coming on the show, Rem Lachateau chat, that will be a good one. And uh, we've also got Lawrence Brightman coming on, another talk on remote viewing. So we've got some interesting subjects coming up. And as usual, any recommendations, please send them forward because we do love to get recommendations from you guys because at the end of the day, we want to get the guests on that you want to hear. So anything else, David? No, donate something, you cheapskates. Well, that's all I'm saying. That's always uh, that's always handy. But um, if not, just link the show to your friends. Let them know about it. Keep downloading the show. We really appreciate all those that are downloading the show. Um, feel free to become a part of it. We have got that live show that is going to come on. It's slowly we're slowly um, um, working on it. It's just sort of a tiptoeing towards it, but it's, we're getting there. And um, you guys will then be able to also call in, whether they be monthly or every few weeks or so often. Um, and then you guys can call in and, and contribute yourselves. So. Um, we want you to be as much of a part of it. Keep down, keep downloading the show, telling your friends about it. And um, I think that's it for this week. So um, I think uh, it's time to say goodbye. <laughs>